So as we look at April 4th, approaching April 4th, and, and I might add that this morning or today, this we've been involved in some activities. Uh, my wife and I went to join a state representative uh, who, her name is Park uh, Cannon. And Representative Cannon happens to be a friend of our families. But she, a few days ago, knocked on the governor's office as an elected official representing Georgians to get into the room where they were signing the bill. And instead of allowing her to come in, they arrested her and charged her with a felony. That is sick. And so that just goes to show how much work we have to do as we approach April 4th, the day my father was killed. We should be celebrating many victories but we have many more rivers to cross before freedom, justice, and equality is a reality for all humankind. If you could implement and create a law today, what what law would that be? There is a bill in the United States Senate that helps to mitigate what these legislators voted for in Georgia, which is called, it's HR, HR 1 and S1. It passed in the House already. Hopefully it passes in the Senate. And that bill will overshadow the things that they've done. I don't know if the support is there in the United States Senate because it's 50-50, 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans. The vice president breaks the tie. But there's also a standard called a filibuster where you must have 60 senators who would support that legislation for it to pass. And I'm sure they're not 60 senators. They're not, you know, 50 Democrats and and 10 Republicans who will support it. Uh, So I'm very concerned about that. And then there's the John Lewis Voter Registration Act that also would help, but I'm not convinced that that it can pass either. Maybe it will. Uh, I do not know. But uh, that would be the one piece of legislation initially, or the two pieces of legislation that I would hope that would pass at the federal level that would not so much invalidate all of what has happened, But if 40 states vote for something, the federal supersedes the state to some degree. And so that that would have a huge impact. Uh, And that's the only thing that I know as one step that can happen. Now, of course, in Georgia, we're filing lawsuits. There have been suits filed against the state of Georgia, um, and it has to go through the court system to as to whether or not these laws are constitutional. And no one knows what way that's going to happen either. I was told that you would also like to talk about fair wage because your father fought for a fair wage um, and that that was what he was taking up at the time of his activism. What would you say is a fair wage in today's world and what would you say what would you like to say about fair wage in general? Number one, I think that that what is being discussed now around the nation is universal basic income. And dad was talking about a living wage back in 1967. That's probably what got him killed because today the minimum wage is somewhere around $7. And yet we're talking about moving it to $15. And people are pushing back. We can't even get Congress universally to agree that the minimum wage needs to be moved up to $15. We've got a huge problem. That would create the concept of maybe a living wage Um, And so my my point is, dad was talking about a living wage in this universal basic income, which actually is being touted today. We've seen it manifested by um, the stimulus packages. We've seen three stimulus packages that most people have been a part of receiving a check. And I think we're going to end up having to see another one. Uh, And I think those packages help stimulate the economy and help people get back on their feet. Um, And I think we're going to have to have more discussions about a basic uh, universal uh, income for people. I think that's what, you know, again, that's what dad was talking about, uh, you know, 54 years, 55 years ago. And yet now we're just beginning to see some of it that has come to fruition. I don't think it would have even happened had that not been the pandemic. The pandemic created the condition where government had to do something to help businesses, to help people, uh, the average human being. Um, 
And had there not been a pandemic and we were talking about, you know, a guaranteed basic income, they would have said, well, that's socialism. That's that's a form of communism. Well, they can't say that because people and businesses need help. And the government is there to assist the people. Would you, Martin, or perhaps you, Andrea, would you ever consider running for president? No. <laughs> and I certainly, I certainly don't see that in my future. That's mm-hmm. not where I think God is leading uh, at least the two of us. And, um, you know, Yolanda one day has to make her own decision if, if she chooses to do something like that. But, you know, our objective is to get the work done, all three of us. And we'll, we'll have to see what manifests as a result of building this huge coalition. As I think I started off saying, we as an organization, we with 100 organizations, will not be able to achieve this goal. But with thousands and millions of people working together, we can make it happen. We can eliminate or reduce poverty significantly. We can eliminate racism from the face of the globe. We can uh, minimize violence in our nation and, and, and we believe throughout the world. With this vast, vast group of people working collectively together, Right. Question of conscience, that if we um, all come and join together in that coalition of conscience together and remember to do it all through um, nonviolence, because nonviolence simply is love and action. Um, a lot of times people, I think, confuse nonviolence or when we talk about love and think about the, the, the sentimentality of love, and certainly that is one form of love. But when we're talking about love within this context of this work, we're talking about a love that is unselfish and undefiable and that does not seek anything in return. And it's a love that is based on the belief and knowledge that we all are interconnected as humanity. And with that love, we could and we could take that love out into the world and and really care about what happens to each other and to our brothers and sisters. And that's the type of love that that we speak of when we talk about nonviolence. Absolutely. That's really beautifully put. Um, And speaking about love, um, how did you two meet, Andrea and Martin? How old were you? And when you met, did you know who he was and who his father was? We were set up on a, I was in my early 20s, and we were set up on a, a blind date. And certainly I think that obviously, um, well, we had talked on the phone for about a month beforehand and felt, uh, you know, a certain connection with each other. And then we both agreed to meet. So I knew who his his father was, but, you know, I, I was from Florida and we were, we hadn't grown up here in Atlanta and throughout all of that. But um, I always say, which is true, that I quickly realized that he was the best man I had ever met. And uh, I obviously <laughs> want to want to concur with her. Uh, she <laughs> was the, the she was the greatest <laughs> woman uh, in, in what I'm saying. I mean, I want to I want to <laughs> compliment. Uh, but I, you know, sometimes it takes men lo- a long time to come through through things. There were some things in her that reminded me of my mom from day one. And, you know, it wasn't that she was, uh, they say that men often are looking for women like their mothers, if their mothers are are, are impactful to them. And obviously, you know, my mom was larger than life for me. Um, April 8th of 1968, my father was killed April 4th, April 8th. We went to Memphis. My mother took the older children, my brother, who was younger than me, Dexter, and my older sister, Yolanda, uh, to Memphis. My younger sister, Bernice, did not go. And she led a march that my father uh, was intending to lead or was supposed to have led had he lived. And what makes that so incredible was no one had been captured for the murder of our father at that time. It was a very dangerous, potentially dangerous decision, but mom made that decision and wanted to expose us as her children uh, to 
to, you know, I, I, I mean, she had the strength of, I, I mean, I, I don't know many men who after losing their or any, uh, their wives in a situation like that would have been able to go and continue in that tradition. That only says to me that she was fortified with the movement in her heart that I, I must, you know, I must do this. And then, of course, we came back the evening of April 8th from Memphis, Tennessee, after she'd led that march with the, the three older ones of us. And we had the funeral the next day, April 9th. So, you know, my mom was, to me, larger than life. And when I met Andrea, I saw many of those qualities uh, in her. And she was younger than me, quite uh, a number of <laughs> years younger. But she was older than me in a sense. You know, men are like little boys. We don't, all, we don't ever grow up. We're always silly. We, you know. Uh, and she was very serious. And she, she knew where she wanted to go, even in her 20s. And I, I was still meandering, trying to figure out well, where, where am I going to go? Okay. And so once we met and became, you know, marriage is two people attempting to become one. And there, there could be tension. There should be constructive tension. Uh, and it, it's wonderful when it's constructive tension. Uh, because, again, you're, you're trying to become one. And he also, you know, you also have to be friends because sometimes in any relationship, it may get difficult, but that friendship along with that being in love and that love sustains you during those times where it might be a little difficult. So, you know, I, I just feel so blessed to have Andrea uh, in my life. And I, I'm not sure, you know, what I would have done if I had not met her. Uh, and the more I live with her more every day, I realize that even more, uh, just how important she is to me and to Yolanda and to us as a family unit. It's, I mean, we, we are a unit. Um, and, uh, you know, all of us try to bring something to the table, but in, in a real sense, she is our rock of Gibraltar. And let me say this, uh, since, Throughout our meeting, uh, let's see, I have, I've lost a grandfather, a grandmother, a mother, a sister, and cousins. And one of the qualities that Andrea has is when we, you know, when we're going through trauma and tragedy, particularly losing a loved one, she is, you know, she doesn't break down. Some women and some men, but some people would just break down. I, they couldn't handle it. But she becomes extraordinarily strong and supportive. And it's rare that you find qualities in human beings like that who can stand up in dignity and, 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 and with elegance. I mean, she's so elegant to be able to, to support. And when I went through those, you know, tragedies, she was right here with, with me. And it made it it's not easy to ever lose a loved one, but it made it easier. And most recently, we lost her mother. And I was tried to be there for her. Uh, that was the first on her side, uh, who was very, very close, because she was extraordinarily close, um, my mother-in-law, to her daughters, as well as to her granddaughter. And so th th that was a difficult one for all of us. But I, I hope I was strong for Andrea, but I don't know that I have been as strong as she's been for me. Uh, it has been nothing short of remarkable uh, to go through these very tragic times and have my wife and partner with me 